Hello, world. This is your host, Colin Wilson and... Justin Kampf. Uh, bringing you episode two of The Iron Cast. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about change psychology. But before we get to that, we got a few things we want to talk about. Uh, first and foremost is the Strength and Conditioning Symposium coming up a week from tomorrow, April 5th. Yep. Uh, Justin, you want to give us a quick rundown? Yep, so one more week. If you do plan on attending, it's going to be in Sperry 105. So, again, if you didn't hear before, we still have a lot of great things going on there. We have five awesome speakers. We're going to have some hands-on activities. We're going to have, again, I think I said it last episode, but Tony's going to be doing assessments. Or Tony Gentlecore. Tony Gentlecore is going to be doing some assessments. John Gaglione will be go- going over coaching deadlifting, squatting, bench pressing. We're going to have some strongman outdoor stuff, uh, if the weather is good enough, of course. And we'll have Dartfish, which uh, basically is a program that analyzes barbell movements for things like the squat, the clean, the deadlift, and such. That's awesome. So you're actually going to have somebody set up using the Dartfish software? Yeah, we talked to the Dartfish Club at SUNY Cortland, and they are on board. That's awesome. All right, guys, so um, again, as I mentioned before, that is April 5th, the first annual Strength and Conditioning Symposium here at SUNY Cortland in New York State. Uh, So next I want to talk about, uh, again, is uh, sponsors, as we mentioned in prior episodes. If you want to hear your company or your product advertised here on the Ironcast, please send us an email uh, with all your information, and we'll get back to you and let you know what, uh, you know, what works. What's up? What's the email? Oh, the email is cwilson315 at gmail.com. That's my personal email. We'll, uh, we'll make it happen. Um, so just a recap from last week. We talked about fun. Uh, there's a lot of cool topics that we touched on, a lot of things that we both personally use in our training as well as uh, when we're working with clients as well. So uh, with that being said, I think it's about time we get right into today's topic, the change psychology. Justin, cool. you want to take it away? Yeah, so I have quite a few studies in front of me and quite a few books that I'll link up into the references section that we can we can probably put something like that down there, references section for what we're talking about. Oh, yeah. But, ladies and gentlemen, he has basically a book he's typed out in front of him right now. It's actually kind of funny. It is a, it, it's like a few pages. Anyways, so I just want to talk about the goals of today. And those are your notes? Yeah, my, those are my notes. Nice. I, I wrote them it. in. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, awful. Makeshift. Make yeah, uh, yeah, flashcards. Anyways, the goals are talking about changing habits. And what I want people to get out of this is what can the trainer apply to a client and what can the listener apply to themselves to live a little bit of a healthier lifestyle. So two goals right there. So what I wanted to talk about first uh, it was a very interesting study on the placebo effect and exercise. So if you don't know what the placebo effect is, oh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I apologize, but we have a special guest host in the studio today. Um, her name is Sophia Delila, and she is one of the foremost experts in the field of babies uh, because pooping she pooping in her diaper. A uh, pooping in her diaper. She is in fact a baby. So Sophia, come on. What do you have to say on the subject of pooping in your diaper? Oh. <laughs> Lies. She does that. She has one. What? She has one. In oh diaper. no, she doesn't right now, but she okay. will. She Hopefully, <laughs> we can capture it on uh, on podcast because she has some epic old man toots. <laughs> Keep this PG. We should call her man toots. Man toots. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So okay. I, I apologize for interrupting, but Sophia, she she deserved an entrance. So uh, back to back to what you were saying. Yes, yes. Okay. So we kind of just talked about the goals real quick. What I wanted to talk about first is the placebo effect and exercise. An interesting study that I read on basically mindset on how you're going into an exercise program. So for those of you who don't know, the placebo effect is basically any effect that's attributed to any individual's mindset or expectations. Sorry, I actually said that wrong. It's any. So basically, think about it like this. Did she just? Almost throw up. <laughs> nope. When, this is going to be an entertaining yeah, podcast be today. <laughs> so when they do clinical drug trials, they have basically what um, they have a real pill and they have an inert pill, and they have to look at 
A nerve the, pill? A nerve pill, so not like a sugar pill, basically. Right. Yep, so they have to look and see, is the actual medicine more effective than the inert, like, sugar pill? So basically, it's measuring how powerful someone's mind is, and, and it's really very interesting. They mentioned in this study, for a clinical uh, drug trial on depression, they found that only 25% of the responses were due to the drug, and actually 51% was due to the placebo effect. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. And they mentioned things like uh, sham shoulder or knee surgeries, which basically means fake surgeries where they might give you give you a, basically a fake surgery. And that was actually found to be all, like as effective as a real surgery, which I find is absolutely insane. I think I would be pissed if I got a fake surgery. Yeah, but you don't know. <laughs> Do they like still cut you open and everything? I'll, uh, I'll read it off. I'll read off what it says. Okay. Oh, this is interesting. So... Subjects exposed to fake poison ivy develop real rashes. What? Yep. Uh, people imbibing placebo caffeine experience increases in motor performance and heart rate because <laughs> they thought it was caffeine. Uh, patients given anesthesia and fake knee operations experience reduced pain and swelling in their healed, quotation mark, healed tendons and ligaments. So, that's, isn't that insane? I need to look up more information on that because if they're still, like, cutting your knee open, because you still have to... For that that to go through, for that placebo effect to like really take an effect, you still you gotta see a scar. You gotta see. You probably see a scar, but I mean knee surgeries are different now. It's like they can have little incisions. You don't. Oh, right. You might not even know. Huh. So the scars are probably smaller. That's crazy. So, which is just crazy because it all ha- a lot has to do with the person's mindset and their beliefs. Mm-hmm. So what they did in this study is they were looking at mindset and exercise with hotel maids. So I'll just read like. The design real quick what they did for these um, subjects so there's two groups one group they so basically they went over is the exercise that you're getting on a daily basis of a healthy amount so what they did for one group is they said that the exercise that you get in your work related environment is sufficient to meet the general needs and then for another group that they said nothing so one group had the mindset that what they were doing uh, was sufficient exercise throughout the day. The other group didn't think that they were getting sufficient exercise, although there's really no difference in what they were doing. They were all hotel maids. And the interesting thing is that at the end, I think it was after 30 days, you can see that the group that actually thought that, that had the perception that they were doing more exercise actually lost more weight than the group that didn't. Huh. Now, that could be due to a number of things. They the study attributed it to how, how you're thinking. In my mind, I don't think that that makes that much sense. What I think happened is that these hotel maids probably already thought that they were getting sufficient exercise, so they probably got a little bit more exercise throughout the day, and they probably ate a little bit healthier. Um, just because I think that that mindset that they had, um, it's almost like you have to have small wins first. Oh, I'm already doing good. I'm going to keep doing better versus uh, this, is, this is pointless. I'm not even going to try to live a healthier life. Oh, so that, it's kind of like if you if you miss a day of working out, you already feel crappy about yourself. So why keep going? So what, then you just go get fast food, and you're like, yeah. Why keep Why keep going? Where on the flip side, you have a really great day of working out, and then you come home and you see, <laughs> yeah. you see man toots. You see man toots. Uh, but you see, you know, like the fast food restaurant on your way home. You're more apt to pass it because. You just had a great workout, and you're like, I don't need that. I've got yeah. a salad at home. I'm already doing good. Why would I do something to make it worse? Right. Yep. Um, so, basically, what, what can, like, a trainer take away from that? This is actually from the book Motivational Interviewing, but they say, the counselor, so we'll say the trainer, the trainer's own expectations about a person's likelihood of change can have a powerful effect on the outcome, basically acting as a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, trainers, if... The client comes to you and says, I want to lose like 30 pounds. You know, if you give them confidence that they can actually do that, that might be the first step in the right direction. And that kind of moves into um, confidence and importance for when you want people to change. So there's four categories looking at importance and confidence. So we can look at people might have low confidence and low importance of the change that they're trying to make. And really, nothing's going to happen there. If they're not confident that they can change, and if it's not important to them, they're not going to change. Um, they can have low importance and high confidence. So 
if, if they think like, oh yeah, I can quit smoking anytime I want, but it's not that important to me right now. That would be an example. Not on the flip side, they could have high importance, low confidence. So I really need to quit smoking, but I really don't think that I can. And on the other side, it's high importance and high confidence. So if someone came into you and they wanted to lose weight, and it was very important to them, you could help them with that confidence, basically by kind of giving them some sort of strategy. Does that kind of make sense there? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So the bulk of that is I, what I wanted to get into was why do people change? So why, why? And we're kind of going to talk about obesity, bad health habits. Why do people start becoming healthier? Um, read a narrative. It was by it was I think 127 people, and it was on failed versus successful attempts at life changes. So what they came what came out of this was that a few things. Changers when compared to non-changers like they take responsibility for their actions when compared to non-changers. And then the non-changers were more likely to mention outside barriers to change. So what do you think? What have you heard for barriers to change? Oh man. So There's, many. Yeah, I was just going to say I don't even know where to narrow it down to. Um, you know, oh, I don't have time. I don't want to get up that early. Um, fast food tastes so good. You know, oh, I, I don't want to deprive myself of those good foods, the foods that I like. Yeah, and then we'll remember some of those, some of those barriers and how to, if you're a trainer, how to help people overcome those barriers. Uh, so basically, when, when comparing these changers, who would change their life habits, whether it's, you know, quit drinking, quit smoking, live a healthier lifestyle. The changers mentioned focal or critical events that could be basically considered, um, you consider it like the straw that broke the camel's back. So something happened in their life that made them want to change. I remember I did an interview with an individual who talked about how all of his relatives in his family had like heart attacks and then his father ended up having a stroke and he, that was kind of a critical changing point in his life. So that would be one reason. Um, other reasons, just illness, death of family members, or observe, even observing somebody else that had a successful change in their life. So another thing, people who change their behaviors associated those behaviors with negative emotions and suffering. And that kind of reminds me of the story of my, uh, my aunt's sister. She lost like 120 pounds. But yeah, she, was ba she said to me that she was basically at a point where she was quite miserable with how she was. So she kind of hit like that breaking point or the, that rock bottom point. So, other thing, changers mentioned other people as a reason for change. So, if you're not going to change for yourself, you might want to change for somebody else. If you're an overweight adult and you have a kid, or you want to stay healthy for that kid. And th those were just some of the reasons why people changed. And that's not necessarily in control of the, of the trainer, because that kind of is just events that happen to people by themselves without really any intervention. In fact, a lot of people change without any intervention. But I feel like significant, serious change, a trainer can try to facilitate, can try to like motivate change, but mm -hmm. until that person themselves makes that decision and says to themselves, I am going to change, you can try as the trainer all you want. Like, oh man, you really need to stop eating cookies during their workout. <laughs> Seriously, that's not helping. Yeah. Um, and if that person doesn't want to, they're not going, they're not going to stop. To. So I think it's it's huge that these aha moments, like, ah, oh, yep, yep, I need to change. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good point. Something that I ask people and that trainers can ask people, three questions just to see their motivation level. Are what you, is your favorite color? <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, what is the airspeed velocity of an African swallow? Yes. <laughs> what is that from? Uh, Monday, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Oh, I should probably see that. You haven't seen that? I've seen where the guy gets his hands cut, or the knight gets his, yeah, he gets cut in half or something. You are beaten! Step aside! <laughs> no, I'm not! Tis but a flesh wound! <laughs> Alright, segue All right. over. Anyways, three, the three questions that I always ask, and that's, are you ready, are you willing, and do you feel able to make changes? They might sound the same, but they're really, really quite different. Um, we'll get into the a little bit later but yes those are the three questions because if they don't say yes to every single one of them they're probably not going to change so, so we'll, we'll break down each one of those questions in a little bit yep are okay. you ready are you willing and are you able to change so 
Actually, you know, we, when we, if, if it's on topic, it's, let's it's talk fresh, about it. Yeah, it's fresh, yeah. So those, those are like the components of motivation. So what willing means is the extent to which the person wants to change. So as a trainer, it's like how can we, how can we enhance the importance of this change to these people that we're working with? And I think that's a tough question. Is there any? Do you have? Have you done anything to help enhance, like enhance people to change? I mean, it it's really hard. It just comes down to again, as as I've said before, and you said before, if the person's not willing to make that change for themselves, it it is so very hard to convince them otherwise. Because uh, no matter what coercion you use, no matter you know the stories, until something happens in their life that's truly significant that, you know, kind of signals that change. Um, I feel like we can, I don't know, there may be a foolproof way to do it. I don't, I sure as heck don't know one. If I'm, I'm stubborn as hell. <laughs> if, I, if I'm not willing to do something nine times out of nine, uh, if you try to talk me into doing something I don't want to do, chances are I'm not going to do it. Yeah, so you have to be willing. Yeah. The, the one that I think that trainers can help alter is able. So the person might feel willing, but not able. It's like they don't, they don't know the path, they don't know how to do it, and that's kind of where like a trainer can come in and provide this strategy. So one thing that I do that, I, that I've taken completely from precision nutrition is the idea of giving like just small health habits to do every, like I pick one habit, <laughs> picking one habit up basically every three weeks. So what habits are is basically behavioral autopilots. So motivation, I, I think of motivation as a muscle. You can stress it, but the more you stress it, the weaker it's gonna be. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, so he has yeah. some thoughts on this topic. Yeah, she had Professor of Dookie. <laughs> yeah. Professor of Dookie University. Yeah. <laughs> oh, where was I? Okay, yeah, so motivation's like a muscle, so you put anyone, like, in a room with Oreos in front of them, eventually they're going to eat it. I know, you know, you would. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If I didn't deep fry it first. Yeah, yeah. It's an, it's an exhaustible resource, so there's only so long that you'd be able to say no to. So that's where habits are really great, because it's just a behavioral autopilot, and you don't have to rely on motivation anymore. So, back to, back to Abel. So, I took this from uh, motivational interviewing. And it said, given sufficient importance, people find an avenue for change that they believe will work and they believe they can do, they will often pursue it through behavior change. So if someone finds something, some kind of change important, like uh, I want to eat healthier, um, and you give them the, a strategy to follow, then more often times than not, they will do it. So the strategy that I use is just give them one health habit and have them do that for three weeks. So some of those health habits include, and this is something that people can apply to themselves, exercise for at least 30 minutes four times per week, take fish oil at breakfast, drink at least eight cups of water, eat at least one four, or eat at least four one cup servings of vegetables a day, get at least eight hours of sleep. Uh, during each meal, stop when eating 80% full. Uh, twice a week, get up and walk around for five minutes eat lean protein with each meal so those are just that was eight so, so that would be not at the same time though right no nope. just one of those at a time yeah so that would be like a 24 I mean if you did one every three weeks that'd be 24 weeks right realistically it could be a little bit longer but when you're doing one habit it's kind of a lot easier to stick with than trying yeah. to do then if you change everything it's such a shock to your system you yeah. tend to go right back to what you did before. Yeah, it's it's actually quite difficult to change your whole life at once. So, one change at a time is a little bit better. So that's one strategy that people can take out of that. And one strategy that they can apply to their clients is implementing one change at a time. And the last one was, are you ready? So what that means is that if they're not ready, it might not be the most important thing at the moment. So like if someone wanted to quit smoking, they might be able, they know that they're able to do it and they might be willing to do it. Maybe they have other things going on in their life and they're just not ready to do it. Because honestly, if you're trying to change something in your life, it's going to take a tremendous amount of effort, especially if it's something that's addictive or so deeply ingrained. Right. So especially with like smoking or alcohol, you have those withdrawals. So if you're going through a hectic part of your life right now and 
yeah. you know, you, somebody tries to, no, you can't have that anymore, and you start now having a physical dependency, uh, withdrawals, on top of whatever stressors you're already going through, they're definitely not going to be easy. No, absolutely not. So you have to have, you have to be ready, willing, and able. And that's, just, again, that's just something that I ask all of my clients before they, before I even start talking about changing any kind of habits. So do you go through and explain all of them to them? Or do you just ask the three questions as is? Or do you like actually go through and say, are you willing? And explain what your definition of willing in you know context to these three questions. I usually leave it open-ended. I'll, okay. I'll ask the question and I'll let them explain themselves. Okay. So, And then that goes back to empowering the client, letting them explain to you, not you explain to them. Yep. I, I, I probably talked about that in class way back when. Did I? I Did we do? We, wow, that was like a year and a half ago. So long. So long. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you want to say that again? It's um, so basically, you by letting them interpret the questions the way they see fit, it empowers your client to make decisions based on what they think and what they want, as opposed to you outlining what you want for them. Um, so it gives them a better sense of empowerment over their workouts, over their goals, whatever they're doing. Yeah. Whenever, whenever I, God bless you. Whenever I talk about that. I actually call it Inception. Inception. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's just like the movie. It's a goal within a goal within it's a goal. Within, yeah, exactly. It's when um it's when the client generates the idea rather than you. So if you tell a client what to do, they might go into defense mode. So if I I think we actually talked oh, about yeah, it last, in the last time. episode. Yeah. So I don't. I want to touch on it real quick. Yeah. So I told Colin, Colin, you gotta stop eating cookies, and then he came up with a bunch of excuses as to why he can't stop eating cookies. <laughs> he can't stop, won't stop. For, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Versus if I asked him, what do you think that you need to do to change um, to meet your goals, he might tell me the, the same thing that I was going to tell him, but it's a little bit better if he generates the idea rather than myself generating the idea. Because I own the idea as opposed to letting you piece it out to me. Exact mundo. <laughs> so yes, it's just, it's just like an inception. Inception. So he wakes up and he sells the company, right? I only saw some of that movie and then I fell asleep. You did? Yeah, I, I went into dreamland. Within the dream? Within the dream. The dream was that I was watching Inception, and within the dream I fell asleep. What if we're all just in a turtle's dream in outer space? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is that? It's always sunny? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's, let's move on to some other stuff, which okay. would be... Okay, so we did ready, willing, and able. Those are questions that you want to ask. I think another big component of change, if anyone's trying to make change, is the environment. And uh, you actually, yes. you talked about that for a second earlier before we talked. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can say from personal experience, and uh, I've also read a really interesting and uh, insightful article on Cracked.com. Um, it, it, was, it was from a while ago, but it, I'm sure if you searched for it, you could find it. It was like five or six things I learned uh, as my time as an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And it was really crazy to hear uh, some of the things that this, this writer offered in terms of insight on his experiences because one of the things he talked about was environment and how certain friends of his, the only, he would hang out with them often. Mm -hmm. The thing that tied them all together was that they all drank. So he would be going out with these friends because they were all he knew. They were his only friends that he had at this point in his life. Um, and they would just go out and get hammered five, six, seven nights a week. And he was fine with it until he started finding that other areas of his life started to uh, degrade. Mm -hmm. And he was just, he wasn't happy anymore. And he realized it, it's such a lonely existence because... To get rid of these friends, who are the only friends you know, the only friends you have at the time, but they, they influence such bad decisions, and when you're around them, you take part in bad life choices. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying drinking's bad life choices, but alcoholism probably isn't the most productive um, thing in the world. Um, not. In terms of a lot of stuff. But um, he found that by making the stand, he, he got to the point in his life where he was like, I need to stop. I need to change. 
um, he had that aha moment, yep. and he stopped hanging out with them. And he found, I mean, he, he had those withdrawals because he, had, he built up a dependency on alcohol. Um, he, once he was able to get through those initial, that initial period, um, he was so much healthier. He was so much happier. He found new friends with um, uh, hobbies, interests, more akin to what he liked. So he, instead of partaking in these unhealthy choices, he now found a new group of friends who partook in more fun things, like he was big on video games, uh, so he found like a... Better than getting hammered, I Oh guess. yeah, way better. <laughs> World of Warcraft, I don't know, World of Warcraft I think is actually physically addicting. I know some people who have thrown their lives away in that game. That is not a joke. That's awful. That is sad. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's one of those things where the environment, who you hang out with, You've mentioned it before. It's I, I think it's a it's a quote by somebody somebody, somebody bigger than us. Yeah. Uh, you are the sum of your five closest friends. So if your five closest friends are all going out getting hammered, you know, five, six, seven nights a week, chances are really good that you're going to join them for five, six, seven nights a week. So if you can find a different circle of friends, uh, like I know our circle of friends, what do we all do? Powerlifting. Yeah, we <laughs> oh, lift, I don't. We lift. I just I lift lighter things than you guys. But you're lifting them. I am lifting them. Yeah. I do like to lift things from the ground up. Yes. Yeah. I love doing that. <laughs> it's way better than going out. Oh yeah. That's um but that sounds like a focal point, so that was one of the reasons why people Do you want to quote Arnold on the feeling of lifting? No. No? Okay. No. <laughs> I don't no, want to no. quote Arnold either. I don't if you know the quote, you can laugh to yourself. If you don't know the quote, don't look it up. Look it up. Look it up. Look it up. <laughs> uh in that because you made, you made a really good point uh, for focal points in that narrative on the failed failed versus successful life changes one person said they didn't say what the habit was but they said the ultimate reason that I eventually did it meaning changing the habit was that I knew I would be dead within a few weeks if I didn't make that change Ooh, yeah that's uh, that's a big focal point oh yeah <laughs> yeah so another person said I became disgusted with my life and decided that I had had enough I think that person was a hippie. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm done being a hippie. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. I think that's what they said. I think that's what that's, she was a hippie. W w is this from a research study? This or? is from a research study. Okay. Do you yeah. have the title? The I do. It's, uh, per, it's like personal narratives of failed versus successful life changes. Okay. We'll Just link, in case we'll any, any uh, listeners took offense to the hippie comment. You can look it up for yourselves and actually see. It is science. That, uh, yeah. As long as they said hippie. Yeah, yeah, they did. Their words, not ours. And in another study, it was about the spread of obesity within social networks. And this is, this is actually frightening. So get underneath your covers. Okay. <laughs> Everyone take a seat. We're all, we're all set. So they found that the odds of becoming obese increased 57% if a friend who became obese in a certain time frame, or if a friend became obese within a certain time frame. They found, what they did in the study is they looked at different kinds of friendships. One was, does one person perceive the other person to be the friend? So one person might say, oh yeah, he's my friend. And then the other person would be like, nah, not really. So <laughs> Just those are options. Somebody I work with. Yeah, and then the other, and then you could have the other option of being mutual friends. So both of them agreed that they were friends, so they probably hung out a lot. This was scary. So when they friends when oh, they considered God. themselves mutual friends, if one of them became obese, the other person had a hundred and seventy one percent chance of also becoming obese. And then the other ones were the odds. I, I just have a, yeah. How did they derive one hundred seventy one percent? I don't know. It's is, isn't hundred just kind of like isn't that supposed to be? Isn't that supposed to be enough? Yeah, hundred is like absolute certainty. Well, I'll tell you, if I'm buying a supplement that says one hundred seventy one percent increase in muscle growth, <laughs> maybe it's I don't know. That's a good, I'm gonna have to take stats again. I'm, yeah, it's I, either between that or. Um, killing myself because I don't want to I really don't yeah, want to that's, yeah that's not that's not even an option no so that's I'm, not even on the table it's taking that right off the yeah I'm not I'll take stats I won't don't worry I won't, I won't do that yeah I took stats that was awful although we did do a kind of a cool survey that was interesting I did learn I actually did learn quite a few things that I still use um, in P terms of Excel equals yeah it's it's intense 
But I think that if anyone wants to read research, it's important because now I'm just like, yeah, I don't know how they got 171%. But they did. Yeah. They're smarter than me, so I'm going to take their word for it, which is not no, the best no. approach. <laughs> which actually, I definitely think that should be another topic of one of these podcasts. Because uh, there was the, remember that red meat study uh, a couple of years ago? What that, so it's getting a lot of backlash now? Well, no, it, I don't know if it's getting backlash now, but I just remember um, the one of our professors in our department, in the fitness development uh, department, brought it up and mentioned it in one of our classes. It's like, oh, if you eat bacon, you're 33% more likely to die. And I, I raised my hand. I was like, aren't we all 100% likely to die eventually? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Where I don't even know where these numbers came from. Yeah. And then I, I did a little more investigation on my own, and I looked into it, and... Uh, one of the one of the authors of the study was Dr. Dean Ornish. Oh, well, the, propri- the proprietor of the the Ornish diet. If you're unfamiliar with that, it's all vegetarian, no yeah. meat. Um, so of course, if he's on the committee, he's gonna try to Biased. demonize, villainize, and use his biases against meat. Um, but if you look at the stats, if you look at the figures, the people who ate the most meat also exercised the least, also got the least amount of sleep. And also, uh, were more than likely to be smokers. Smoke the most amount of crack. Yes. <laughs> uh, but none of these things were shown in the final results. The final results only said, which was all over like CNN and all that stuff um, for like the week after it came out. Oh, eating red meat, it'll kill you. No. It's like, well, what about all these other risk yeah. factors that people are partaking in that you failed to mention? Like, you just, so I definitely think people need to look more into research studies and find out who's, who's doing them, because if it's, if it's a guy who's all about powerlifting, and he's on a survey or, or on a research against marathon running, of course he's going to be like, oh, it's stupid. Yeah, you should just lift. You should just lift. Do you even lift? Do you even lift? But that's one that you said, there's all those other variables that didn't take into account. You got to do a multivariate analysis. Mm-hmm. You, have, you can't just look at, you can't necessarily look at one. F- Correlation is not equal causation. I think that's the... Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Where were we? Oh, we're percentage, still... perc- how did we get percentages? Yes. Then? It was mutual friends. There, There's there's a couple more. 171%. 171%. We're giving you 100%, 171% of our time and effort right now, ladies and gentlemen. I'm only giving 92 <laughs> Wow, I'm leaving some. But you, you well, I, I, I'm actually only giving 91. Ooh. But Sophia's giving the other. However, I can't do math. She's in deep concentration right now. Yes, yeah, she is. She sees that little tiger in front of her. She's like, "What is this?" Oh my god. Anyways, they found that I don't even know. I don't even remember if I just said this, but they said that the odds of becoming obese increased 40 percent if you had a sibling that became obese. Mm. And the odds of becoming obese increased 37% if you had a spouse that became obese. So... Now, I, this, is, this is curious for me. Um, just because... W- does it work on the other end of the spectrum? That's, so, that's, I, that's a great question. And yes, they actually mentioned that. If we can see... <laughs> let me make a funny metaphor <laughs> today. <laughs> if we look at it this way, if we see that negative uh, health habits affect other people, there, certainly it can happen the other way. Is that what you mean? Positive yeah. health effects can affect other people. So, unfortunately, it's that most people have these negative health habits and it's affecting more people than the people that are doing, you know, these healthy activities. I, so, I, I, yeah. it's, it, this is one of the things that really irks me. Mm-hmm. It really grinds my gears. Yes. Lindsay uh, Lohan, right? Uh, I was going Peter... Griffin on that yeah, one. But, yeah, but she, he's like Lindsay Lohan. Oh, yeah. Like, what do you oh, want from yeah. me? She does grind my gears. Um, no, this is one of those things. It's it's a really, really interesting dichotomy in just, I don't know if it's just American psyche or just human psyche, but if you look at, in your study, you've got two people, two friends, one becomes obese, so the other becomes obese. That's a, let's, let's call that the negative outcome. Yeah. Um, but now let's say we have two obese friends and one of them gets fit, gets healthy. It it's almost seems like you see it all the time on Facebook, all on the social medias. You got somebody who becomes fit and show off. 
Like, why you gotta... Yeah. You're such a... Sh- and now it's almost like we're, we're gonna ostracize this person who went from an unhealthy state to a healthy state. Is it is it because we're, we're self-conscious? Is it because we're insecure? Is it because we know the amount of hard work that they put into getting healthy and we're not willing, we're not ready, we're not able to do this? Like, it's just such an interesting mm-hmm. psychology. And there was actually um, a, a, an article circulating on Facebook the other day about how like the fit community is shaming people yeah and it's just like i maybe yes maybe some people are doing it blatantly like oh i'm super fit i'm better than you yeah but i'm pretty sure there's most people are just proud of the hard work anytime you do hard work on something it's just it's human nature to kind of want to like i don't want to necessarily say show it off but just be proud of what you did, what you've accomplished. Um, and again, these people are making healthy life choices. They're doing healthy things. Unless you're a bodybuilder, then you're not doing healthy things. Yeah. You're yeah. you're starving your body of essential nutrients, and it's probably better than being obese. It is probably. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I if you do it right. If you do it right, yeah. There's certain things that I feel like can't be healthy in the long run, especially the mental, mm-hmm. the mental aspect, especially for female competitors. That's I talked to some female competitors about the the repercussions of the day after the competition, and when you look at yourself after having your refeed meal, and you're just like, oh, oh my god, I want to look like I did yesterday. And it's just that's what I was saying. I was destructive. Say, I was saying I don't cut nearly as much as a bodybuilder, but I was saying I cut weight from powerlifting meets, and I have the ideal body of my dreams in between. The time that I weigh in to the time that I find a jar of peanut butter, and that's like 20 seconds. So, get all your so I Instagram snap pictures. off as many selfies as I can, and then I eat my peanut butter. It's, oh. a, be- it's a beautiful thing. It is. Yeah, it's just it's so interesting how we we shame those who have made healthy life decisions, but on the same token, people who have made the healthy decisions do on occasion, help, you know, go to oh, it's fatty, you know, like stuff like that, which is just uncalled for. Yeah. People should just abide by the golden rule and everybody would be fine. I, like, when I started lifting, there's definitely people that would poke fun at me. Like, oh, I'm going to the gym? Yeah, I'm going to the gym. <laughs> and then I'm, now I'm at a point where years later, it's like I'm deadlifting over 500 pounds. I just hit 555. <laughs> no big off. deal. And people are like, whoa, you know, you're taking this seriously. You're like, like, I don't know anybody that can do that. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it took me like six years of hard work. I'm and 24. Scrutiny. <laughs> yeah, I'm 24 now. I'm, so I started when I was like 18. So it's like I spent six years doing this, and now, and now I might be motivating people to do it. Yeah. And look where you're at. This whole yeah. time you've been scrutinizing me and trying to knock me down a peg. I wasn't knocking you down. Oh no, no, not oh. you. No, <laughs> no, your your haters. Yeah, I got haters. It's like, what do you mean? What do you mean broccoli? <laughs> I've been eating Brock Lesnar. Yeah. What? What? Huh? I just assume he's so muscular that he has extra muscle to eat. Yeah, you could eat him. He's huge. He's a freak of nature. I could be love. I love professional wrestling. I've been thinking of a way to tie professional (laughs) wrestling into this for so long, and I just found, as soon as you said broccoli, I really thought you were going to say Brock Lesnar. I wasn't. I got excited. He's going to take on The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30, which is the day after... The Strength and Conditioning Symposium. It's what? April 6th. April 6th? Yeah. Okay, so that's awesome because Un- or Captain America, the Winter Soldier, comes out the 4th. Whoa. Then, Strength and Conditioning Conference, and then your whole Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker thing. Mind so, blown. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It is a three-day party. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. Um, <laughs> the Plaza Movie Theater here in Cortland, New York. I'm not sure what time it's going to be on. Actually, it probably won't even be there. It is April. It's not May. I'm not wrong, I hope. I hope Am I wrong? They're, they've been advertising a lot lately. Yeah. George St. Pierre's going to be in it. Is he? I met him. You did. I, saw I shook his hand. He's, he's pretty awesome. He's definitely... He's uh, very French. Yeah. He's not, was he as nice in person as he is? Um, uh, no. no? I, don't, I don't know. I oh. don't know. He was just did off you, after that fight. Mm. He was did you cool. actually have any, any conversation with him? Or? Uh, hey, man. How's it going? Can I take a picture with you and put it on Facebook so everyone thinks I'm cooler than I am? That was about it. Because, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I've heard stories of, like, ah, pro wrestler. Uh, John Cena, you know, he's the he's 
He is the poster boy, the face of the WWE. He is everything that's good about everything ever. And then I've heard stories about him at like airports uh, or whatnot, and he's just a jerk to fans. I cannot validate or verify these these reports. These are just we'll invite John Cena on the show next episode to either uh, confirm or deny the. <laughs> John Cena, you heard it. Uh, this is an open invitation uh, if you'd like to defend your honor. Um, also, we heard that you have a third nipple hitting on your butt. <laughs> so again, if you would like to defend these accusations or deny them, um, this is the place to do it. Air your grievances here. Can, let's go back to... <laughs> back that to was like four minutes. Yeah, so. but that was four minutes of yeah. solid gold. Yeah. We t- okay, 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 okay. Real quick. Last stats, I promise. Oh, God. Because I thought that this was also interesting. I think that's why I got off topic, because we started talking math. Yeah. I swear I have Asperger's. As soon as you brought up math, I was like, don't care. Oh, my God. (laughs) I'm doing more math. Just, it'll be quick. Bear with us, folks. It'll be quick. So, the study, which was actually massive. It had over 12,000 participants. Another number. Which is massive. So, they had main subjects. They called those subjects egos. And they had people that had interactions with those subjects and they called them alters. alters. Yeah, yeah, so you read it. Yeah. <laughs> and they said that the risk of obesity among alters who were connected to an obese ego was 45% higher in observed networks when compared to random networks, so if they did, if they were related to them. At two degrees of separation, it was 20% higher, and at 10 degrees of separation, or sorry, at three degrees of separation, it was still 10% higher, so you might not even know these people where they could be of influencing you somehow. So can you put it in real just stupid, Zombies. It's stupid. like zombies. <laughs> so if you get bit by a zombie, your zombie friend... If, all right, so yes. Okay, let's not put it in zombies. So I think no, zombies I, has one degree of separation. No, no, because if, if, I, if I bit a zombie, someone they turn into... I'm a zombie right now. Mm-hmm. I bite someone, they turn into a zombie, and they turn their friends into zombies. I'm just thinking about it as obesity. Wait, so... Walking Dead, season finale, Sunday. Oh yeah, yeah. Ooh. Anyways, so that means two Sundays in a row we have some. Yeah, but I can't. Watch. But I can't watch it until Monday because I don't have cable, so I get it on Amazon. So that's four Did days in a row. It? Yeah, I do. Oh wow, it's like one ninety nine. Money ain't a thing. Money ain't no thing. Yeah. Um. So what you're saying is okay. So we'll take we'll say the alpha, the first, the yeah. the ego. Sure. Okay, and then you have so like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. But only three. Yes. And we're still at talking four, if, bacon. If, yeah, <laughs> at, four, at four degrees, there was no real... They couldn't find a relationship. Okay, so it... Like, I don't even need to know the ego. If I... So the ego's sister, the sister's boyfriend, and I'm best friends with the boyfriend. Yeah. Just because I know the boyfriend of the sister of the ego, I'm 10% more likely. Yeah, but that's just percentages. It's like, is that, is that clinically relevant? I don't know. That's, that's, but it's still it's something pretty interesting to yeah even like calculate I guess because I mean I feel like we all everybody knows an obese person just yep. because of the the such high numbers in America at this point mm-hmm. hell right now I'm for my height by the BMI charts I'm technically obese obese not overweight I'm overweight I might well I don't know you're probably overweight you're yeah. not obese okay I don't know I'm I, like 26 I, I think I'm 27. Okay, you're fine. Okay. Fatty. <laughs> that 25 and over was... 25 and over is overweight. Oh, 30, oh. 30 and over is obese. Ah, yes. Good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Oh, God. It's like that Chappelle Show episode where it's like, what are we going to do about the obesity epidemic? We're going to raise the criteria for what it takes to be obese. <laughs> what? I've never seen that episode. Really? Is that like the hidden... Uh, the, or the third season? Yeah. Maybe? I don't know. I've got all the seasons. I'll let you borrow it. Okay. Yeah, it's hilarious. It was when he was pretending to like go for office... George, um, when he's George Bush, or what? Well, I don't no, know. No, when he, when he was uh, like, um, just a mock, running for president. He's, uh, you know, well, what are you gonna do about the obesity epidemic? <laughs> Race the criteria. Yeah. So instead of you know your BMI has to be uh, thirty, it's now like forty, <laughs> and he's like, he, he goes around interviewing people. He's like, how do you feel that you're no longer obese? Oh man, I knew if I just stuck to it long <laughs> enough. You know, I, I would get there. It's, it great. feels so great to be overweight instead of obese now. That's great. Yeah. That's awful. We'll have to link that. We'll, we'll link find it. that clip. It's, it's funny. Um, okay. Stats. On top. On top. I'm done with stats, actually. Woo. So that was, that's just the people that you hang around with. But what about 
like the actual physical environment where you are. And the way that I think about it is this, is that you're not going to escape a poor physical environment in the United States. Uh, it's so much easier to eat bad than to eat healthy. In fact, oh, yeah. one strategy cheaper. Yeah, one strategy was to put uh, healthy grocery stores in poor neighborhoods that didn't have that option. And they actually found that just putting healthy food stores in, in within close proximity did not guarantee that they would shop at those stores. So it's not even that that simple. It's like if if you put it there, does it mean that they'll go? Actually, it doesn't. So even if presented with a healthy option, it doesn't mean that they're going to take it. Right. Which is crazy. Which is where why change is so difficult. I feel like that there's like a. I mean, obviously, there's probably a myriad of reasons for that, but off the top of my head, first and foremost, if you've got a family of three, four, five, you know, more than just yourself, oh, it's so much easier just to tell somebody what you want, they make it, you bring it home, yes. than it is to actually go home and prepare. Plus, more often than not, because of people's, the, the economic disparity in America right now, you got families working two, three jobs just to pay rent. Who has the time to sit down and make a meal anymore? Um, so it, it's not only, it's out of necessity that I feel like people are ordering bad food. It's not even out of, they don't want to do it. I mean, some probably do. But I think it's out of, I literally physically don't have time between leaving job A, going, picking up food, bringing it home to my family, and then going to job two. Um, it's just, it, there's... And then obviously the the price tag, you know, uh, if people are working two jobs just to pay the rent, how the hell are they going to afford now, you know, organic free range, yeah, which is another to, topic yeah. that we need to talk about because the, the, the criteria to be able to call your product organic or free range is extremely lenient. So yeah. as long as you meet like one or two uh, label um, checks, che like the checklist or whatever, you can still have a myriad of other things that are not organic or not free range. So make sure you look into that in the future if you if you pride yourself on your organic free range stuff. What was I just going to say? She just made another good point. Oh, we were talking about how the, uh, if they put healthy grocery stores in poor neighborhoods, they still didn't go. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and a lot of that just has to go simply down to habit. What if you habitually Use M&Ms. No, they're cough drops. You want one? Oh, uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Are you sure? What kind of it? Uh, peppermint? Yeah, whatever. Sure. I'll try it. Why not? You didn't even I like to coat my throat. throat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just because it's there doesn't mean that people are going to go there. So, And even if we look at, you, you said it, barriers to eating healthy. You, one of them, how do I cook something healthy quickly? I don't have time. How? And a lot of people just simply don't know how to cook. That's what I run into. It's like, oh yeah. You know what's easy to make? Macaroni and cheese. Oh yeah, Easy Mac. It's easy built into the name. Yeah, hamburger <laughs> helper. But those are just, those are just a few barriers. That's actually something I never even thought about. Was just not only is it expensive to buy the good food, mm -hmm. but just the expertise on how to make it actually taste good. Mm -hmm. That's something I feel like people need to invest in spices. Spices. Spices are huge. Spices can take just a regular, plain old, boring chicken breast and turn it into a feast. Um, so definitely, if, if that's if you find yourself having problems with this, look, uh, get a get a Pinterest. My my wife has found so many incredible recipes off of Pinterest. Stay away from the sweets. Stay away from the treats because there are some crack like sweets and treats on there that if you see them, you will want to make them. Uh, so just stick with like the healthy cooking, uh, Pinterest, whatever, because there are some amazing meals that give you exactly how to do it, exactly how to cook it. Um, so I feel like you don't need to go buy those, those cookbooks anymore. You can do it off that. So if you have the time, and I think another thing to help with that, um, just make all your meals on a Sunday. Most people, I mean, I, I don't know anymore, but it, it used to be a tradition that most people had Sundays off. Um, probably not anymore. Yeah, probably not anymore. But if you do find yourself having a single day off of the week that you know you have off, schedule like two or three hours, cook all your food for the entire week. Um, whether it just be your lunches for work, uh, if you work nights, your dinners, whatever, 
um, because that makes it so it's less time that you have to invest later in the week. And if you can just get it all done and over with all at once, it makes it a lot easier. You're more apt to do it. You're more apt to stick to those foods. Um, and if you can, you know, make it healthy and make enough for your family and yourself too. So that way when they come home, if they need a snack, you know, you portion it out into little Tupperware containers, uh, which is another thing, portion. People eat portion control is big. You know, even if you're eating healthy food, you got a huge ass portion, huge butt portion of it. They did, um, talks about this in the book Switch on portion size. They had big popcorn buckets and they thought that people were just eating all this popcorn out of like gluttony, but it just turns out it's because it was a big portion. It was just in there. movies, they're just going to eat it because it's there. You know, give them a smaller portion, they'll mm -hmm. they'll eat less and they'll be fine with it. So bigger, bigger size equals eating more popcorn. Yeah. Okay. Did I did I share the example of the environment change already with my with one client? I don't think I said it. No, not yet. So just a just a personal story. I had a client come in to me. And she had always, I wrote this in the link we'll put up, and she had always ate pretty healthy during the day, but on her way home, she would pass by multiple fast food restaurants, and that was when she would screw up. So it was her environment that was kind of messing with her. So what I recommended is that she just find an alternate route home that didn't even drive by any fast food restaurants, and she ended up doing that. And wow, that was a lot easier. I didn't see it, so I'm not gonna go to it. So that, that's Remove one- that temptation. Yeah, that's one way to alter the environment. Don't drive by the fast food restaurants, don't have cookies stop. in your house. Because even if you tell yourself, I only have one cookie. You're not. No, you're not. Once you pop, you can't stop. The only surefire way for me to not eat peanut butter is to have it not in the house. <laughs> if it's in the house and it's not mine, I will eat it. I will be a thief. <laughs> That's actually That was actually true. in your lease agreement, wasn't it? Thou shalt not steal <laughs> my peanut butter. No, no, I didn't have to sign that. Oh, that's good. Mm -mm. I can eat as much peanut butter as I want. We should probably not do cough drops in the future. Yeah, if we keep doing that. Yeah. I'm gonna tuck it in my cheek, not my, my mouth cheek. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's talk let's <laughs> let's talk about goals. Different kinds of goals. I want to talk soccer about goals, lacrosse goals, hockey goals. I think soccer goals are the most dramatic. Yeah, it's South and Florida. But but I meant like uh, not those goals. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, there's two different kinds of goals. You can have outcome goals and process goals. So a lot of people come into you as a trainer or as yourself trying to make a goal. And you'll have an outcome goal, so that might mean I want to lose 30 pounds. When you really should be focusing on the process. It's, losing 30 pounds isn't guaranteed in a certain time frame. But a process goal might be, I'm going to eat vegetables with every meal. That's a process goal that's easily identifiable. And that's what I encourage a lot of people to do. Did you do that? Yes. Those process goals will get you to the outcome goals. So, basically, focusing on uh, distant future makes it easy to kind of say, oh, I don't have to do this now. So if you're just thinking about some version of your ideal self a year away from now, it might not seem like you have to do it. But if you're thinking about week to week doing these certain habits, like the ones that I mentioned earlier, those are a little bit better goals to set than those outcome goals of I want to lose 30 pounds. Any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I definitely agree because it's so easy if you if you have a long-term goal that that's your only goal the the outcome goal it, It's easy to lose sight of it sometimes because you can you can justify things to yourself You can you know make excuses like oh well, it's just it's just one Taco Bell run It's I'll still eventually yep. Get my outcome goal. It might just and now it's just a day later um, Whereas a process goal if you make a process goal like done eating Taco Bell, you know, every time I feel like I'm going to eat Taco Bell, I'm just going to have a piece of salary. I don't know, that's obviously really <laughs> stupid. <Sounds> <laughs> <awful>. <laughs> that's a terrible substitute. Yeah. Um, but yeah, having those process goals, they keep you on track. Um, I actually had a professor uh, for business, he talked about, because he, he used to and still does fly planes. It's, uh, what's your name? Ward. 
Yeah, he was an awesome teacher. Yeah, he was. Very controversial, and there's a lot of things that I didn't have enough self-confidence to kind of raise my hand and argue with him about, because mm -hmm. he's very, he has his opinions, and he's not afraid to say them. Mm -hmm. um, if I had the confidence that I have now, back then, I would have loved to have raised my hand and, like, rebuttaled his counter, or his points. Mm -hmm. But he, he brought up a really good point about how when he's flying, when you're landing a plane, you have set points along the way. The more set points you have, the more you know you're on track. So when you're, I, I, I'm going to make up these numbers completely because I have no idea the actual uh, flying terms. Uh, let's say you're 500 yards away from the landing strip. You want to be 600 yards from the ground. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're 450 yards. Now you want to make sure you're 500 yards from the ground, vertical. So like the more points you have to checkpoints to make sure that you're on track, the more likely it is once you finally get to the end goal, the landing, you're right where you need to be. So if you if you only have a start, like, oh, I'm in the air, mm -hmm. and the end, I want to land, you might, you know, be in the air and then come straight down. Sure, you got that end goal, but it's not the end goal you want. Um, so the, having more points along the way to keep you on track to make sure you're doing the right things uh, will definitely help you achieve that end goal that is desirable that you want. Yep, that's like um, sub goal. So if you want to lose, goal, if yep. you want to lose 120 pounds in a year, you should be losing 10 pounds a month. So you can check that in. Did I lose 10 pounds this month? No. So what do I have to change? Did I lose 10 pounds? Or did I lose uh, 10 pounds this month? Yeah, I'm gonna keep doing what I've been doing because it's working. Stuff like that. To think. We've, been, we've been going on this for a little while yeah. with, with a re, approximately 50% um, random stuff, but that's okay. Uh, I would definitely say we're at, at least maybe 43% random stuff. 43% random. Stick to, with the numbers theme. Numbers. I'm trying to think of what, what, else, what else we, we have here. Uh, any, anything else or also kind of give some like closing thoughts here? Um, I definitely, I mean, to... Oh, I guess this is this will be closing thoughts. Mm -hmm. Let's just let's just close the thoughts. Okay. So closing close them. closing thoughts here for a trainer working with somebody or for a person who wants to change. You must be ready, willing, and confident to change. So that's that's motivation. Um, you want to look at who you hang around with. So that's your environment. You also want to remove yourself from environmental cues that trigger bad habits, like what I said with my client, how I had her do a, take a different path home. And let's see, another thing, make one habit change at a time. So those eight habits that I kind of mentioned can be good. So those are good ways to change. We'll link up references to further reading that might be able to help trainers, that might be able to help people. Um, so that, that's, I think that's about it. Yeah. I, I mean, they're, they're basically people, if you want to make change, you have to you have to be ready. You have to be willing. You have to be able, as you said. Um, and it's sometimes it's not easy because it, what seems like a simple task, like if you just if you just have the end goal, and you say, "Oh, I want to lose this amount of weight," that's that's super easy to say, but in practice, it might actually be way more difficult to realize than you think because of unhealthy behaviors, unhealthy uh, environments. So it might actually be a more daunting task than you originally first realized. So by setting those sub-goals, by setting those process goals, you allow yourself trial and error almost. Um, you give yourself a chance to realize, like, okay, so I'm going to start losing weight. Going out with my friends five, six, seven nights a week, drinking is not conducive to this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that out. After, you know, you... You've you found a new group of friends, which this could take a while. This is it's not, not easy. this is not a, a quick overnight success story. This is something that it takes time. It's 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 not easy, unfortunately. Um, but you know the best things in life never are, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it don't get discouraged. It, it takes time. Once you do surround yourself with that positive environment. These you want to surround yourself with people who are supportive of your goals and you're supportive of theirs because you guys all have similar ideas, similar goals. 
Uh, so if you surround yourself in a fit community, chances are good that you're going to get fit, they're going to get fit, and everybody's going to be inspired by each other's hard work. So once you've done that, then you can start making another change, and then another change, and then another slowly but surely. Eventually these little things will build up. It's like that, that old credo, uh, how do you need an elephant? One bite at a time. You don't try to eat it all at once because you're going to die. Yes. You will die if you try to eat an elephant all at once. If you take little tiny bites, it's you can chip away at it over time. So don't... The moral of the story is change psychology. It takes time. It takes effort. Don't get discouraged. If you need a buddy, you know, if you need a confidant, an accountability buddy... There you go. I, I'm huge on accountability buddies. Uh, my best friend, he is my accountability buddy, whether he realizes it or not. I text him every day with the workouts that I'm doing uh, just so he can either say well, that sounds too easy, or have him go woof, which is Buzz's girlfriend, woof. <laughs> um, but for me, you know, with stress and lack of sleep from having a, a newborn baby, you know, she's about to be six months, so I guess I can't even call her a newborn she baby. Sighs. <sighs> That's me. <Get> <laughs> I'm so famous. Get she's going. internet famous now. No, she um, I, I know for me with stress and lack of sleep, it's... It's devastated my body. It's uh, it's made it very hard to um, keep weight off. I, I really, I'm not even eating that much. And when I do eat, it's it's usually healthy, and I still have an issue of retaining a lot of weight, which I attribute solely to higher levels of stress from having a baby screaming in my ear, and uh, you know lack of sleep. So, and that's that's a something that will eventually change over time when she gets older. She's going to sleep better. She's going to be able to talk, you know. The, but then there's a whole slew of other other headaches that will run you into still have, <laughs> You still have 18 years. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then I'm going to have to start beating up boys. Yeah. 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 Or girls, you know, whatever. It's America. I don't want to beat up girls, though. I, I'll let my wife do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's the more um, legal way to take care of this. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, internet, world, don't get discouraged. If you're trying to make healthy change for yourself, stick to it. Don't give up. Uh, it's a hard road, but it's a road worth traveling. So, with that being said, April fifth, uh, right here in SUNY Court, or right here at SUNY Cortland in Cortland, New York, is the first annual Strength and Conditioning Symposium. Can you just give me the the speakers again? John Gaglione, Tony Gentilcore, Lou Schuler, Cassandra Forsyth, and Mike Roussel. So that is an all-star lineup. Uh, if you guys are in the area, if you can get in the area, please come check it out. It's going to be an amazing time. There's going to be so much interaction with these people um, it, while they're talking outside of the area because these are all really, really cool people. They're all down-to-earth, uh, sociable, so they'll have a, a great opportunity to ask questions, get to know them, and learn a whole bunch of stuff because there's going to be a lot of uh, activities associated with it as well. So um, if you go to our website, bloodandiron315.com, and go to the sidebar, there is a link for the registration. Uh, just click that. It says Strength and Conditioning Symposium. Click here, uh, and you'll be redirected to the registration page. Fill that out uh, ahead of time, and you get a price discount. If you don't, you can register day of. Registration begins at 8.30. Uh, any and all relevant information is on the website, correct? That is correct. All right, so make sure you come out to this, guys. It's, it's an extremely awesome opportunity. You get CEUs if you're NASM? NSCA. NSCA uh, certified. So that if that's not enough incentive, I don't know what is. So um, WrestleMania, April 6th. It's going to be great. Captain America. Uh, Captain America, April 4th. That actually looks pretty cool, too. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. That Winter looks Soldier looks pretty boss. Um, so, again, bloodandiron315.com is our website. And this is episode two of the Ironcast. Thank you so much for checking us out, guys. Have a great day. Peace.